So when Jesus uh, gave Matthew uh, the, the things that he said that were recorded by Matthew that ended up being later, later assigned to Matthew chapter 13 about the parable of the sower of the seed, he warned the uh, people, he warned us, he warned anybody who read those words in the future that, uh, broadly speaking, God's truth would be difficult for most people to accept. And indeed, in most people, it wouldn't take root. And then there would be some that would be receptive, but for various reasons like personal turmoil, they would not be able to overcome that, and they still, God's word still wouldn't take root. And then some people it would take root in. And it's the job of the church to nurture such people, that to help them to uh, come into God's truth. And God's plan of salvation ensures that every single person will have their full opportunity at some time in their life, even if it's the life after the resurrection. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 60, Jesus explains that God the Father determines who can come to him in, in any given age and who cannot. And he was very explicit or with this uh, in John chapter 6, where he said, But there are some of you here who do not believe, for Jesus had already known from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who would betray him. And then Jesus said in verse 65, Because of this, I told you that no one can come to me, no one can come to me unless the Father has allowed him to come. And notice he was speaking openly about a context that was more than just Judas. And in fact, the very next verse, John records that many of his disciples quit following him and left. Some of the things that Jesus said were just too difficult for them at the time to accept and act on. Later, in the sequence of events during his time on earth, as Luke records uh, uh, in chapter 13, verse 22, there's a very short parable about entering into the narrow door and that at some point the door will be tightly shut and preventing any more to enter. And then those outside and those who Jesus does not recognize will claim that they are following him. And the point I want to draw your attention to is Luke 13, verse 27. And I can read that for the sake of time. But he will reply, I don't know where you came from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. I don't know where you came from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. And please take note, this people can claim to follow Jesus, but he does not acknowledge their claim and indeed calls them evildoers. So they are self-deceived and they may yet deceive others. And so even before the crucifixion, while he was still opening, openly interacting with people, teaching and performing healing, and there are more than just a few people who did not accept what he had to say, who had their own idea about how to worship God, even though Jesus said about them, Depart from me, all you evildoers. During the life of Jesus, this reached its apex after the, his arrest when the crowd of Jews yelled their rejection of Jesus. And the high priest said, they are, uh, the high priest that said that the Jews have no king but Caesar. After uh, the day of Pentecost and the founding of the Church of God, it did not take too long before people who came into the church and who sought a, uh, sought a different gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, Paul warns about a gospel that is different than the one proclaimed by the apostles. And in the Net Bible, the translation says, For if someone comes and proclaims a Jesus different from the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or a different gospel than the one you accept, you put up with it well enough. So some people even accepted this difference, even though... Uh, it was not the true gospel, not the true Jesus, and not the true spirit. This was written about 56 A.D., so more than a generation after the crucifixion of Jesus. But it gets worse. In the last paragraphs of the second epistle to Timothy, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, he, he says, uh, Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas departed from me. Departed. Here he had someone who worked with Paul, knew Paul, and departed, deserted from me, since he loved the present age. And he went to Thessalonica. Uh, Crescendus went to Galatia. And Titus went to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him. How lonely would you be if all the people that you knew in church, you were down to one? Get Mark and bring him to you because he has, a, he has been a great help to me. Alexander the coppersmith, in verse 14, did me great harm. <clears throat> the, and then later on he said, uh, you should be on guard against him because he vehemently opposed my words. He opposed the words of Paul. And the first defense, no one appeared to be my support. And then they deserted me. Just look at what Jesus says about the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, where in verse 13 or 18, he talks about the woman Jezebel who has false prophecies and teaches them to commit sexual immorality. And so we see from the very first public ministry of Jesus all the way through the end of the age, yet in the future for us, despite all these warnings, many people, maybe most people, who even come uh, to the church just cannot fully accept the gospel and don't stay faithful to the faith, faith once and for all delivered to the church, as Jude said. So take heart, please, with your own lives. And this is the narrow way, and it takes commitment to stay on it. So as part of this story, some of the disputes in the gospel later on in the church even arose to the level of calling in and involving the civil government. The Jewish religious authorities conspired to induce the Romans to murder Jesus. Well, we could rehearse that as part of this is Passover. We do this after the resurrection of Jesus. The apostles gathered behind closed doors, not for fear of the Romans, but for fear of the Jews at least at the time. And I want to draw your attention then to Acts chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Acts chapter 12, verse 1. And this marks a new escalation in how government relates to the church. Um, about that time, Acts 12, 1, about that time King Herod laid hands on some from the church to harm them. He had, the, he had James, the brother of John, executed with the sword. Verse 3, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter, and so on. And we can, this goes on down to chapter 5, where Peter was kept in prison. This escalation was when the head of a government saw a strategic political benefit in how to position his own administration against the church, which was at the time a social phenomenon. All prior interactions with government had been because officials were reacting to specific and isolated cases. Government then increasingly found it to be the benefit to suppress the church. And as I stated recently, this is part of the same social dynamic as how the Sabbath was abandoned in favor of treating the Sunday as the Lord's Day. Over time, at least, some of the people who left the church still sought to have a relationship with God but more on the terms, on their terms, and on the doctrines that were doctrines they liked. So gradually, the church, as the church grew, so did the number of groups that did not hold fast to the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. By the time the apostle John had died, the last apostle alive, there were people claiming to be heirs to the teachings and doctrines of the disciples, but who were in fact actually in stark opposition to them. Over some times, some arose who proposed ideas that were wholly outside of anything the church ever taught or that any uh, disciples ever recorded in their writings. This gave rise to a social controversy and thus a significant expansion, expansion of political opportunity that, uh, that officials could leverage to their own benefit. Again, up until the moment that despite the that the deep state of the day was reacting to Christianity and any uh, disruption that Christianity caused in society, you know, the, the disruption like the riot 
that uh, great is the God of the Ephesians, which I think is kind of interesting and notable and frightening. But this was about to change. Flavius Constantinus was born in 272 A.D. and became emperor of Rome in 306 A.D. after the death of his father. <clears throat> Although a pagan, raised a pagan, he began to be interested in Christianity around 312 A.D. And he played a role in supporting the Edict of Milan in 313 that declared tolerance for Christianity uh, should be given in the Roman Empire. At this time, Christianity had a number of organized churches, some of which had political influence. There, there arose a number of doctrinal issues. History records that Constantine convened and presided over the first general council in the history of that church at the behest of, the, of a prominent bishop. There were a number of items on the agenda for the council to resolve, and about 300 delegates from around the empire and beyond attended. A few weeks ago, uh, as we were having the Sabbath meal, I said to Mr. Dobson that since this year our Passover observance falls on the 14th of Nisan, I would talk about this aspect of, of the Council of Nicaea. The, pre, uh, the expression on his face was priceless. A careful reading of scripture makes it very plain that, the, that there is only one day for Passover at all times. It is only the 14th of Nisan, as we know. One of the agenda items for the Council of Nicaea was to officially determine when Christianity should absorb the Passover. Our, one reference call, uh, called it simply, quote, separation of Easter computation from the Jewish calendar. That describes it perfectly. Uh, in, a, in a move that, ap that appears to have similar dynamics as was documented by Samuel Bacchiocchi in his research in Rome about how the Sabbath was changed to Sunday, there are two main motivations, the dislike for all things Jewish and the desire to at least partially harmonize with the Roman culture that was rooted in paganism. The Council of Nicaea dis decided to determine the date for Passover apart from the Jewish calendar and to seek uniform observation throughout the church, which meant throughout the empire. In time, uh, with the adoption of the calendar reforms, the Christian holy day known as Easter became distinctly separate from the Passover, and in time, it actually became an act of heresy to observe the 14th of Nisan. And this brings me to an important point to draw your attention to, really important. Constantine saw a tremendous political opportunity that, had, uh, to, that, that there was to be available to him in assuming official sponsorship of this council as a means to secure more complete control over his empire because of how it extended control over every single citizen in his empire. Thus, organized Christianity started to become an instrument of the state power. Anyone who did not agree with this decision and the degrees of the church that it was sponsored by the state, who opposed church officials that were sponsored by the state, favored, uh, uh, they would find themselves out of favor and maybe even enemies of the state. And this process became even more complete because in 380 A.D., when Emperor Theodosius I issued the Edict of Thessalonica and made Catholicism of the Nicene Creed the state church of the Roman Empire. That's in 380 A.D. History has a way of rhyming, but in a new way, but yet in a familiar way. We were warned in Revelation of a future religious and secular leaders who mutually despise each other for the power that they each viscerally need to get from each other. We are warned that we, uh, will, they will have the means of enforcing their religion via the state. We are also starting to get a hint of how this will be done. Possibly we saw this with vaccine passports where you couldn't even go to the grocery store without having a good score or the social scoring system that we see in China and the monetary system that's being proposed. Jesus warns us uh, that a time will, that that time in the future will be unlike in any human history, and it sure appears that it's, that's true. When government seizes control of what had previously been a private matter, it soon smothers it with its own definition, its own approach, its own policies, 
and preferences. This is the nature of a government power, and we only have to look at our own existence, the only experience that we had in the recent pandemic, as to how pervasive government edicts and statements about private matters of health have intruded in our own lives. Far too many people didn't question what government told them. Anyone who was, had a different opinion was considered to be rebellious, obstinate, quirky, and dangerous to listen to. Anything such, that such people said was misinformation to be canceled. When government establishes by mere power over time, it becomes part of a culture, especially for children growing up knowing nothing else. To bring this back around to my main topic today, 1,700 years ago, 1,700 years ago, just shy a few years, the Council of Nicaea met. How many Christian churches would even entertain today the idea that they should observe Passover? Very few indeed. So praise God that he has given each of us the knowledge, the courage to uh, let the truth prevail in our lives. Please recall these examples of the people who came to the truth but who could not quite fully act on it. Please see how many people today willingly accept what was a calculated political substitute by a Roman emperor that's designed to gain power for himself and his government by controlling people to observe a different day. Recall how easy it was for some people to give up, to let down, to lose sight of all the meaningful and God-designed metaphors that he intends to serve and to remind, to educate and commemorate about the essential parts of his plan in human, in, in, of plan of salvation uh, of humanity. And in this case, the Passover of our <coughs> precious Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs>